Well, hi there, everybody. This is uh, Lenise Bent. That's me. Uh, I'm a sound engineer and producer and proud sound girl. And uh, I'm here today, Friday, March 19th, 2021. Another beautiful day here in Los Angeles, California. And uh, I am delighted today to be speaking to the incredible Sherry Klein, uh, also a pioneer in sound engineering and as a woman. And uh, she and I go back years. Um, we won't even say how many. <laughs> yes, we won't even say how many. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm interviewing Sherry today for the uh, Sound Girls Living History Project. And uh, this will be archived along with a lot of the other uh, projects that have been recorded other the great other great women who have been uh, interviewed um, for this project. And uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this. So, um, so uh, welcome, Sherry. Thank you, Lunise. It's great to be here and it's wonderful to be part of this project. Well, this is this is a lot of fun for Sherry and I, I just have to say, because we've been friends since almost the beginning of our careers. Yeah. So it, it's it's actually quite precious for me to be doing this. So um, with my dear friend. Uh, so um, Sherry, could you um, let's just jump right into this. And okay. um, could you describe a little bit about what you're doing right now before we go down the rabbit hole of your <laughs> my <past>. wonderful adventure? <laughs> in audio <laughs> well at present time i'm a re-recording mixer for film and television and i work with smart post sound in burbank california and um as a re-recording mixer i kind of take all of my past talents and skills and put them to work in this venue um when i was a kid i remember my grandmother used to tell people oh she pushes buttons and plays with dials and watches movies all day in a big building. And I used to go, okay, grandma, that's a bit simplified, but it works. Well, there's, there's some truth there's to it. There's some truth to it. So I just kind of <laughs> let it go. Um, there was no way I could explain to her what I did. And mm -hmm. I always think that it's best to describe what we do as um, we take all of the audio tracks that come to us from the teams before us, meaning dialogue editors, music editors, film editors, um, uh, sound effects editors, all the people that are involved in any production. And we put them together and we mix them. And when it's all done, it's when it comes together, it's magic. It's like the fine art of a dance, you know, a whole bunch of dancers coming together and, and putting on a performance or an orchestra orchestral performance. You hear one player and they're magnificent on their own. But when you put it together, it's just unbelievable it's it's something that you've never dreamed of and that's the same thing with putting all the elements of sound together on a mixing stage for film and television is we're creating a sonic vision to go with the visual that you're seeing and it's uh, a highly technical and creative field people always go oh you're a techie and i go oh that's also highly simplifying it because we have to have a certain amount of technical knowledge and we work exclusively in Pro Tools for the most part these days, but there's a tremendous amount of creativity that goes with it. And I like to think that everything that came before in my career has brought me to this point and has given me those skills to be where I am right now. And I absolutely love what I'm doing. I love going to work and painting sound, you know, playing in a big sandbox and painting pictures with sound. That's fantastic. Now, is um, now so that is why they call it a, uh, a re-recording re mixer, because things have been recorded already, um, but they all come together and they're not, you know, it, they're not perfectly recorded. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, there's a lot of work that has to go into what you finally hear on television and on and and in films well and that's what mixing comes yes. in and and then re-recording it yeah fantastic so um so uh wow uh sherry started out as a as a musician and yes. um 
just a, a wonderful musician and the, the fact that uh, your journey has gone from being a musician to a recording engineer to a post-production professional mixer. Um, take us back to <laughs> the beginning and give us a little idea of what got you on your way and, okay. um, and where you go. <laughs> um, you know, in essence, I always tell people I've had three careers because I had career as a musician, I had a career as a recording engineer, and then as a re-recording mixer. Um, and to go way, way back when my mother forced me to take piano lessons as a child, as many in my time period, uh, many mothers did for their children. Uh, so she sat me down in front of a piano with a piano teacher and I didn't exactly love it, but I did it, but it did introduce me to music. And my mother was a big fan of Broadway shows and we lived right outside of Manhattan in New Jersey, right over the bridge. And so um, we'd have mother daughter days where she'd take me into New York and we'd go and see a Broadway show. And I fell in love with it. Oh. I fell in love with, you know, going to see so many Fiddler on the Roof, Sound of Music. Um, there, there were so many, I don't remember them all, but we used to go in and spend the day and go to a Broadway show. And that was, that became my love. I, wow. I so loved those times. And so as I got a little bit older, um, I did start enjoying piano and I started really listening to music and appreciating music. And then I decided, I was away at sleepaway camp once and I heard somebody play a guitar and I went, I wanna play guitar. And so I came home and I said, can I, can I learn to play guitar instead of piano? And my parents said, okay. And so they let me start taking guitar lessons. And I was probably around 10 or 11 at that point. Wow. But I started playing folk guitar because folk music was the thing of the day and listening to, you know, all the folk, folk artists that were big in the sixties, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you're, who was your biggest influence right then? I mean, what, what was it that you listened to and you went, oh, I want to play that Joni, song or uh, I want to uh, sound Joan like Joan Baez, Joan Baez. Okay. Okay. Buffy St. Marie. Yes. You know, um, those were the people that really like, I was like, oh my God, they're amazing. I want to be just like them. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you'd learn all their songs and you play all that stuff. And as a guitar player, I fell in love with like John Renborn. I remember his finger picking style. I, I, I was like, Matt, I learned to play so many of his pieces on my own. I just, just by ear, I loved it. But another thing that happened on Sundays in my family is my sister and I, my mother and my father, each would have a Sunday in the month that would be our choice of where we wanted to go. So my father cool always had idea. his day. My mother, it was, our, it was our days together. And my mother always wanted to go driving in upstate New York, looking at the leaves. And my sister and I would sit in the back going, are we done yet? Are we done yet? <laughs> you know, although she did get me into antiquing at that time at a year early age, because we go to the antique stores. But my sister always, for some reason, wanted to eat prime ribs. So she would eat her meat. And I wanted to go to Greenwich Village and hear the folk singers. So we would go to Greenwich Village. And this was before Greenwich Village was, um, I say, I call it concreted over. Um, mm -hmm. When it was back in the days when there was a lot of grass and there was this beautiful fountain in the middle that was the natural fountain that was there. And there were folk singers everywhere you looked. There were just people relaxing with their families, with their dogs and listening to music. And it was just a lovely afternoon. And then we would go walk around the, walk, walk around the, the West Village. And one day we happened upon a place called the Folklore Center which was right across the, right up the street, right up the stairs from the Waverly Theater um, and Sixth Avenue. And I asked my parents if we could go up and take a look. And they said, why don't you, while we get something to eat over here? And I said, okay. And I went upstairs and I found out that this was kind of like the home of Sing Out Folk Song Magazine, which I had picked up a number of times during that time period. And the proprietor was a guy named Izzy Young who wrote for Sing Out Magazine. And there was a guy who lived next door named Jack Baker, who was a, a, a guitar teacher. And so I asked my parents if I could come to New York. I was 13 years old, mind you. I asked That's my parents if bold. I could come to New York 
take the subway, take the the bus from the bus from New Jersey to the Port Authority, and then the subway down six the Sixth Avenue subway to the Village, and take these music lessons. And so I did. I started doing that. My mom had wanted me to study music, music, so uh, she enrolled me in some classes at Manus College of Music, and so I took some classes there. But I really didn't care about those. It was the guitar playing that I really wanted to learn. And I spent a number of years taking my guitar lessons. They were tablature style, finger picking style guitar playing. Mm -hmm. I met incredible people because that was during the 60s with the Vietnam War and all the marches and um, protest songs. Protest songs. It was all protest songs. Mm -hmm. um, and they treated me like, you know, the kid, the little kid from Jersey who could play a mean finger picking style. And at the time, the guitar my parents had bought me was a six string nylon Gibson guitar. Um, it was a fairly large body and such. And it was not, I mean, it was a wide neck. So it mm -hmm. was not the kind of guitar that you- Classical would guitar. Yeah, it was a classical to guitar. Folk guitar. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a really good guitar for what I was playing. So a couple of years into it, um, Izzy called me one day and said, hey, listen, um, the guys over at Maddie Umanoff's, which was a guitar store and fix it place down the street. And they used to go down south searching for wonderful guitars, old guitars uh, every year. And when they came back, they would, you know, they would bring them all to the folklore center and keep some there. And so they called me up and they said, hey, we found the perfect guitar for you. Maddie found the perfect guitar for you. And if you can come up here with $100 cash tomorrow, it's yours. And I, of course, so I went to my father and went, Daddy, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll work in the bakery. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll, I'll get straight A's. I'll, I'll do whatever I have to. But please, let, you know, can I have $100? And so I was daddy's girl. And he went, yeah, Ooh. yeah, of course. So he gave me $100 cash, uh, which I put in an envelope and stuck like in my body, if I remember correctly, as I took the bus to the Port Authority and the subway downtown and walked upstairs and had the envelope and I said, Izzy, here it is. It was a Saturday, here it is. And, uh, and he said, over there in that corner, there's a really young lady who's sitting there and singing and picking in your, on your guitar. And I said, yeah. And he said, go over to her. He took the money and he said, thank you. And he go said, go over <laughs> to her and she'll give you your guitar. And I said, okay. So I kind of wandered over and I was just listening to her and she was just like singing gently, not, not anything loud, but singing very lightly. And uh, so over in that corner and sat there for about three or four minutes. And then she looked at me and she saw me looking at the guitar and she said, oh, you must be the young girl that's coming to get that guitar, this guitar. And I said, yes, I'm very excited. She said, well, it's a beautiful, beautiful guitar. And it's a very old guitar. And I hope you have many, many years with it. And, uh, you know, would you like to play it? And I said, yes. I said, what you were doing was so pretty. And I don't know if I could do anything like that. And she said, no, you'll, you'll do it. So she handed me the, the guitar and walked away, you know, and said, nice meeting you, shook my hand and walked away. And afterwards, I went up to Izzy and I said, thank you so much. I love my guitar. This was so nice. And he goes, um, do you know who that, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. I, I'm backtracking because she actually said to me when she shook my hand, she said, hi, I'm Joni. And then she got up I thought and you said she, she I, said Joan. Joan. Yes, she did. Yeah, she, no, said right. Joan. she said Joan. She said, hi, I'm Joan. And then she walked away and I said, I'm Sherry. And she walked away. And, but it was just so weird because it was all very nonchalant and stuff. And afterwards, um, when I went up to Izzy and he said, oh, you met Joan? And I said, yes. And I realized years later that that was Joni Mitchell. And I had <laughs> no idea at the time because she was just starting, you know, she was just embarking and she wasn't really Joni Mitchell, but she was playing my guitar and holding my guitar. And I was just enthralled by what she was doing. It was just so beautiful. She was just so gentle and so sweet. And when she shook my hand, I remember I just kind of looked at her eyes and she had, and that's when I realized years later, because her eyes, I remembered those eyes 
And I remember wow. that it was that it was Joni Mitchell that I had met then. And that was probably a couple of years, not too many years, but a couple of years after when, when I think I saw her picture on an album cover or something. Mm-hmm. I went, oh my God. Ladies of the Mitchell. Canyon. Yeah, that was Joni Mitchell. And and the fact that Izzy said to me, he goes, Oh, you met Joan. And I said, Yes, she's very sweet. And she handed me my guitar. And that was like an amazing experience. But during that time period, I mean, there was a guy named David Peel on the Lower East Side. And he had this crazy song called and an album called I Love Marijuana. We like marijuana. Anyway, he was a he was a he was a, a regular around Greenwich Village at that time. And he used to come over to the Folklore Center a lot and, and hang out and play. And it was with him and a few other guys the, from the Folklore Center. And they would kind of protect me, keep an eye on me. But we we marched in one of the anti-Vietnam War uh, marches that went to the United Nations. I heard Martin Luther King talk. Oh, fantastic! Um, I mean, I, I remember those days because there were so there was so much protest going on, and I was still a young kid. I mean, all my friends in Jersey were going upstate drinking alcohol in New York where they could, and I was going to New York getting introduced to this entire culture that, you know, I never would have had any idea of had I not started taking these lessons at the Folklore Center. And the Folklore Center was the center of folklore music. I mean, it was the start. I think if I remember correctly, um, Bob Dylan even started there. Mm -hmm. Um, Phil Oaks used to play at the church around the corner. Dave Van Ronk, um, so many greats. Ramblin' Jack Elliott. Yeah, they all came through there. Buffy St. Marie, you know, Mm -hmm. Joe Baez. I mean, there's actually a, a very cool little film on YouTube um, called Talk and Folklore Center, I think it is. And, um, and they even talk about Bob, D- Bob Dylan kind of, you know, doing his mm-hmm. early days there. But that was a formative time for me. That was something that I'll never forget as long as I live. Uh, Izzy, oh, I believe, closed really the Folklore Center at a certain point and moved to uh, Scandinavia somewhere and opened up a Folklore Center there. And I recently read that he just passed uh, a couple of years ago, but I believe Jack Baker is still next door teaching. He has a banjo school and I oh keep gosh. sitting down to write him a letter or an email and I just never quite get through it, but they were formative. They were people who formed my musical ideas and my musical thoughts and, you know, um, going to clubs like the Cafe Wa and, um, you know, Cafe Agogo and Village Gate and all that when I was a kid, I was underage, but they got mm-hmm. me in, you know, mm-hmm. so it was around that time that I started playing with bands, you know, local bands. Um, and I would sing, I didn't really play guitar that much, but I sang, I was lead singer for a number of groups. And even on, in a jazz group that I played in, I remember we were we were supposed to play in this nightclub and all the guys were, you know, of age. And I was underage. I think I was six, I was, must've been about 16 at that time. And I looked like I was 12 to tell you the truth. And um, so they had these things called fake ABC cars, you know, for beverage and whatever, you mm-hmm. know, that's, that showed your age. And we paid for a forgery for one so that when I got into playing, uh, nobody could give me any hell because or or bust me because I had a card as far as the club was concerned. So we did lots of things to get around my age and the mm-hmm. fact that I was, you know, doing that stuff uh, at an well, early age. So that gave you your foundation. Now, um, how did you go from there? Where did you go from there? And how did you get to your next okay. phase. Okay. My next fave, phase. Well, you're still on your first phase, your musician okay. phase. Okay. I'm, I'm still on my musician phase. And okay. Um, so one summer, my parents decided to go to the Jersey Shore for the summer. And I went with them. And there was a little coffee house called 30th Street Station. And I went over there and auditioned so I could gig there, which I did. I started gigging there, you know, on certain nights. After the two weeks was up, my parents said, well, we have to go home. And I said, no, 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 mom, please let me stay here with with my friends. I'm just I'm playing music. I'm I'm enjoying myself. You know, you brought me up right. I'll be a good kid. I promise. Just let me stay here with these friends of mine. I brought over two friends that were older. And so they finally said, "Okay," and they went back home. That was also the summer of Woodstock. And so the next big event in my life that was life changing and 
changing in terms of music and where I wanted to aspire, what I wanted to aspire to was we closed down the coffee house and a bunch of us headed up to Woodstock from the Jersey shore. And uh, how did you hear about it or what did they say? Woodstock oh, it was just was. everywhere. What? There was, there was, there was, po there were posters, every radio station talked about Woodstock. I mean, Woodstock was the event. There was no question about okay. it. Okay. And we were young so hippies. You kind of you know? knew what you were uh, heading out to. Nobody knew what they were. Well, if you to. thought you knew. We were going to a concert. Well we were going to a concert. Okay? Big concert. We a big concert. concert that um, a, lot, a lot of people were going to be playing at. You know, that's mm -hmm. all we knew. We didn't have tickets. We figured, oh, we'll get tickets, scalp tickets or something like sure. that when we were yeah. there. Yeah. And as we're going up, we're realizing that we're in a traffic jam and we actually got stuck right in front of my father's store in Paramus, New Jersey, for like 15 <laughs> minutes with me. And, and it was it must have been like 90 degrees and humidity. And I was on the floor because, God forbid, he saw me or any of the guys who worked for me. I was like 10 feet from them oh in the street. God. And we were at a dead stop because the entire That's Route 17 funny. leading up to the New York Thruway leading up to Woodstock was packed. And we started hearing this on the radio. And so little by little, you know, like must have been four hours later that we started making our way onto the thruway and making our way upstate. And we were exhausted and we were tired. And all of a sudden we hear that, you know, they're open. There are so many hundreds of thousands of people coming that they're, we're going to make it a free concert. And the gates were down and people could just go in. So when we finally arrived there, I think we set out at about six o'clock in the morning. I think we must have gotten there. It was still daylight for an hour or two. So we must've gotten there close to six or seven at night or eight at night. And I remember we all, we, we just plowed the car off the side of the road and we started walking in where we heard, you know, where people were converging. I lost my friends that I came with after the first 45 minutes and never found them again. But from that point on, I was just there. I was at Woodstock, had no idea the historical importance of that particular Who five days of my life, but, and it was a three-day event, so five days of my life, um, and I just, I mean, I saw everything, you know, I saw everybody. Um, Who was I mean, your most memorable, or what pops in your head that moved you the most, if there is, you know, I mean, uh, three, I was, maybe. I was not far from the stage, I was in the mud, when I woke up to Grace Slick saying, good morning, people, and the Jefferson oh, wow. airplane. I mean, I remember that moment because I crawled under some, I was, I had some plastic over me. And I just remember kind of crawling out of the plastic and mud in my feet and everything. And I don't know, dreadlocks in my hair, for God's sakes. And I looked up and there was Grace Slick and Jefferson airplane. I remember, ooh, I remember that vividly. Um, I remember, um, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. I remember mm -hmm. that because that stuck in my head because to this day, I still love all the material. Richie Those Havens. Harmonies. Richie Havens. Richie Havens. Oh, that my gosh. That was miraculous. I remember Shauna and I made their debut there, and that was just an incredible performance. How diverse. Um, I mean, every I, single person, that you're meant, every act you're mentioning has, was so uniquely their own. And, you know, of course, you know, the pond, you know, where we kind of wash up and stuff and go get water in places and, you know, um, and there were no jumbo, jumbo screens, you know, then. Really. Sure. So it was just, you were, you just had to fight your way up. And since I was alone, I just fought my way up as close as I could to the front and people weren't standing, you know, mm -hmm. they weren't standing and watching really until, you know, they got excited and then they'd get up and start standing and dancing, but they were just there. Right. You know, they were camped right. out and, you know, little tents and things. And, you know, you'd forge for food, meeting people and just like in the movie, it just, <laughs> I guess, just like in the movie. I mean, I've seen a couple of movies and it thrills me to no end because I just keep going, where was I? Where was I? I was in, yes. there, was in that crowd yes. somewhere. So anyway, I came back from Woodstock. Um, like I said, I was there for five days because I stayed to clean up. And Such it was a, good a three girl. day. Good event. for you. Good for you. And um came home and then that's a whole nother story because of my parents found out and the drugs and all that stuff entered into it and they kind of grounded me for a while but eventually <laughs> uh, I did continue with my music studies and yeah. when you know I was in high school um 
and I started applying to colleges. The first okay. uh, I, I had actually wanted to go very much to because of the open educational um, curriculums of them was Goddard and Antioch. And I did get accepted to both. I got accepted to both of them. Um, I really wanted to go to Goddard. Um, and then I went up for a visit and uh, they were walking around snowshoes, you know, like skiing to class. And I'm like, no, that's not me. And then mm -hmm. I went over to Antioch and because of the timing, this was, you know, 1969, 70, um, people were very, very militant and they were walking around with, I was seeing people walk around with guns and that freaked me out. And I went, no, no, no. Then there was this other school. I, there were a number of schools I got accepted to, but there was this other school that I kind of went through the guidance office one day and I just kind of went through and I picked out, I picked out a, a school and it was called Webster College. And Fantastic it was an, school. At, now, but I mean, yeah. uh, it was Webster College in St. Louis, Missouri. And it was this red booklet and I went, oh, and I started reading through it. And it was very interesting because they had an open educational curriculum also where you could pick and choose from various, you know, uh, various, I don't know what you call it, well, just curriculums or something like subjects, yeah, to, yeah. to study. Yeah. And the only thing that kind of didn't thrill me was at the time, they had a great music department, but the mm -hmm. music department was still run by the nuns because previously it had been an all girls Catholic school. And I believe the head of the school, the chief nun ran off to marry a Jewish doctor from Clifton, New Jersey or something. <laughs> and the school, anyway, the school converted to a co-educational school and they were importing men from everywhere. They wanted to get an equal amount of men and women. <laughs> so they were just like, yeah, they were importing them. So we had co-educational dormitories, we had open curriculum and the music department was still very strict and run by the nuns. So you would get up in the morning to, you know, like 9 a.m. Gregorian chant, strict classical background, okay? Strict that classical Gregorian chant, all, all orchestral, uh, nothing in the new world. And I was getting a little frustrated, but one of the people in my, who was actually dating my roommate there uh, was, a, was this old friend, Sal. And he said, hey, I'm getting out of here after the next semester because I can't deal with this Gregorian chant at 9 a.m. Um, I want to study jazz and I want to study, study modern composition and stuff. And I said, yeah, well, where do we do that? And he said, hey, there's this cool place called Berkeley College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. And that's what they do. They just do. You can major in arranging and composition. And I'm like, whoa, I'm done. That's it. So I applied to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And both Sal got in and we ended up being roommates there and I got in and in, and I quit this, I quit after the first semester. Now I had also studied music at Manus and taken a lot of classes on my own beforehand. So I was very familiar with classical counterpoint and fusion and, and classical um, theory and theory and everything. So mm -hmm. this wasn't anything new, but it's just, I wanted more. So when we got accepted, I said, okay, I'm done. And so I spent the interim period of time hitchhiking cross country and getting into trouble all over the country, all over the place and gigging. <laughs> also, I had a guitar. Every time I found a guitar, I just play in the local coffee shop or coffee house, wherever, wherever I could. At the end of that time, um, I knew I was going to Berkeley. So I took some classes at new school in Manhattan and I went back to the folklore center for a little while and just kind of like, you know, kept up things until mm -hmm. I got to Berkeley and then moved to Boston. At the time, Berkeley was Berkeley School of Music. It was one building, the main one on Boylston Street, and it had mm -hmm. a small kind of Tudor building on, on Newberry Street. OK, it was just a very small, like townhouse kind of building and that we had additional classes there. Um, there were 50 girls to 800 guys. Um, mm -hmm. There were very few women, very, very few. And the first semester classes usually had like a gazillion people in them, because as mm -hmm. you went on in semesters, people would start dropping out like flies. I mean, the first semester was tough. For me, the interesting was because I tried to take advanced placement to move myself forward, but I didn't get through it. And the reason is I didn't understand that I knew everything that they were talking about theoretically in the first season, in the first uh, mm -hmm. you know, semester, but it was by a different name. In other words, 
two, uh, you know, one, two, five, you know, one, three, five, seven, you know, instead of like a six, five or a six, four or whatever in classical terminology. In other words, I knew the inversions that they were right. talking, so about. talking about. I just didn't, chord I didn't know the language. Chord structure. And yeah, chord, chord structure. It was language that I just didn't yeah. know. And so I kind of breezed through first semester fairly easily because it was all stuff that I knew just changing, changing the language. So that was kind of fun. Um, going into second semester was really great. I love that. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I moved through it. I moved through, you know, Berkeley fairly well. I loved being in Berkeley. Um, who were some of monk. the people, who were some of the people that, uh, were your colleagues then? Because so many great jazz musicians and session musicians have come out of Berkeley, especially during that time. You can know, you remember any names? I can remember one in colleagues? particular, Abe Laboreal. We Abe were Laboreal. Same, yeah, we but, were in the same melody and improv cheat circle. We Because that was one class that was sort of okay. jazz history. It was kind of like, you know, that wasn't the classes you really wanted to focus your energy on. So you wanted to kind of get through those assignments fast. So we'd have, you know, like coffee circles where we just kind of trade information mm -hmm. and, and get done with that assignment so that we can move on to the compositional assignments, you know, right, and things right. like that. But there were a lot of people when I moved to LA, I mean, half the studio players I knew from sure. Boston. Well, and th um, to this day, there's a significant number of Berkeley grads. Right. You know. I mean, I never graduated. I left, um, I finally got into for, I forgot which semester it was, but I applied for a line writing, which was a class by a guy named Herb Pomeroy. And also I, I studied piano there, not guitar, mm -hmm. because for I became a composition and arranging major. And I, mm -hmm. I felt that the piano would be, would serve me better. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think at, at a certain point, my biggest problem at Berkeley was I was a sponge when it came to the theory and all the technique and all that stuff. Looking back at the way my life has, has gone, I completely understand why. Um, but at the time, it was almost too much absorption. I mean, I had great, I had, I still to this day have relative pitch. Um, I could sit in the subway and analyze a Charlie Parker solo off mm -hmm. of a Walkman or something like mm -hmm. that if I had tonic and I could write it out. The problem was I stopped being able to innovate. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, understand that but i stopped being able to innovate everything fully totally understand was a sub five of a two five of a you know i could i could i could see it all in my head and i started kind of getting a little bit freaked out a little bit because i i i no longer felt like i had the talent to create i'd go into piano practice rooms and i would spend hours and i just didn't feel like i was getting anywhere and i'd listen to what some of the other people were creating around me and i'm like that's talent that's creative energy at, at its best and I kept turning in these papers, these compositions that were beautiful. I mean, they, they were A's. They weren't mm -hmm. beautiful pieces of music, but they were beautiful, beautifully executed as an assignment. Okay. So yeah. I kept getting structure. A's the, structure. You had the structure, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It the emotion. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't the, in my the, heart. The creation. So, yeah. so, um, so that's, that was kind of like the end for me. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, um, and there was something else that had happened beforehand, which I'll get into next. But I remember turning to the person who was sitting next to me and I said, if I get an A on this next piece, I'm, I'm quitting. And he said, why? And I said, because I haven't been able to write anything in almost a year. And I feel like I've got to forget some of this stuff so that I can start creating again. Mm -hmm. And he said, I get it, but you don't have to quit. And I said, yeah, I do. I, I, there's some other things kind of meandering around in my brain that I want to explore more of. And so I got it back and I got a B plus and I said, that's it, I quit, you know, I'm quitting. So I went to the Dean and I told him that I was quitting and my, my few teachers that I absolutely adored. And one of them said the most wonderful thing to me, he said, well, first of all, he said, I'm gonna let you quit, but I'm gonna give you an appointment to a guy named Hugo Norton. And Hugo Norton was actually teaching at Boston University classical classical counterpoint and fugue and he said i know that that's what you escaped from from your first school but you need this now now is the time to break all those rules and all those these rules and get you back to a point where you are creative again he said i know it's going to be a struggle and i know this is not what you want to study but i'm going to get you an appointment he said you have too much talent to leave this business he said another thing 
do you type? And I said, no, actually, I don't type. And he said, okay, best piece of advice I can give you outside studying with Hugo is don't ever learn to type. You've got too much talent to be put in the front office of any place that you seek employment in this industry, because that's what's going to happen to you. And he said, look, how many women do you see in this school? And I said, yeah, I get that point. He said, don't learn to type. So to this day, I'm still a two finger typer. I yeah. never mm. studied typing. So from there, I went on to study with Hugo for two years and he even taught me when I ran out of money. It was great. Um, but during one of my projects at Berkeley, I had to go down to the two track studio and record. And it was just a two track studio in the basement and run by a guy named Joe Hostetter. And so I recorded, I don't know, some chart that I wrote. And it was only a two-track studio, so everything was live. But it was so cool watching him with these big, big, big dials. Don't, and yeah, turn, yeah. Turning, you know, turning yeah, up. And, big and tone knobs. The, tone knobs and stuff. I mean, I was just like fascinated how he did that. And then he had, there was like a big echo, a big echo, I think it was like an EMT or a clone of an EMT. Um, sitting outside the room and that's what he used for the reverb and it was mm -hmm. just I was fascinated I mean it played was echo yeah played echo it was it was so cool mm -hmm. so that kind of that's one of the things that kind of kept ruminating in my brain and I kept going down there on my off mm -hmm. hours I would go down there I didn't even know the place existed it was like way in the basement like around back mm -hmm. in this small tiny room it's pretty funny, actually. Almost like the AV department. Yeah, <laughs> it was exactly. It, like a closet, you know, the control. Yeah, only the dweebs went down there. Right. So um, so when I left Berkeley, um, I started getting, a, I, I started, I studied, I studied with Hugo. I also took classes at what was the new Boston School of Electronic Music, where I first got my hands on ARP, ARP 2600s and Moog 12s and a lot of whatever synthesizers mm -hmm. were going on at that time and learned about that, learned about sound that way, um, played with all these wonderful pieces of equipment, composed stuff, you know, just started understanding sound and sonics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was awesome. And I also got a job at Jazz Workshop Paul's Mall and I was doing live sound there. That's, I that was one of the questions I want to ask you. I I didn't know whether you had done live sound or not. So I yes, wanted to ask I did, you that. I did live sound at Jazz Workshop and Paul's Mall for cool. a couple of years. And I did everybody. I mean, I remember when Blood, Sweat and Tears came through there, the oh, original fantastic. with Lou Marini Jr. And, and Miles Davis and Muddy Waters. Whoa. Whoa. And yeah, I, I mean, Keith Jarrett. Um, everybody in in two or three years i was there everybody came through paul's mall and jazz workshop there was nobody left out because that was Did just, weather report was weather report yeah weather report was there at different times there was you know i mean anybody who was jazz or even rock you know to a certain degree or light jazz or light rock came through either paul's mall or jazz workshop so i got to do live sound for them and it was fantastic they were great it was wonderful opportunity i i i loved yeah. it and there was also a place called the garage in cambridge and i did live sound there and that was a really big room that was a a real concert venue and wow. um you know uh at the time anybody that was anybody you know or anybody in town that was anybody came through and played there and what I, was the equipment like i'm just curious if you're doing live sound back way back then what could, was it just the pa did you have um... i had a board yeah i mean i set up all the microphones i set up you know i set up everything i ran all the cables um set up you remember what kind mix. of mics were they like uh, 58s or oh yeah no 57s 58s for 21s um, for 21s and anything that was a little more heavy duty you know you didn't yeah, have the, a lot of the condenser mics and, and things like that ticking. no yeah. no and um, K six six six. I remember that mic. Oh, okay. And that, like, yeah, that was one of my favorite bass drum mics, actually, when I was record doing records. Um, but anyway, at the same time as I was doing all of that, because mm -hmm. I was trying to earn a living, not being in school and no longer under my parents' wing, mm -hmm. um, I was able to get myself a job. Well, also, I studied at 
um, Orson Welles Film School. They had an eight track studio and a guy named Wayne Wadhams and Bill Gitt ran it. And so I took the class and everybody in the class was a musician who really was there to get their, their music recorded. And right. I was the only one who really wanted to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so I recorded everybody's stuff. So I became really close with Wayne and with Bill. Wayne so and Bill. This, this is when you were morphing from, from music, being a musician. Right. And... This was in my, hi, my, my hiatus time of being a musician, in essence. Now, was this, um, was it a, like a, a distinct shift when you discovered the room downstairs or going, it was, yeah, well, this is what it is? Or it, discovering it the room downstairs gradual? began the fascination. Mm -hmm. Boston School of Electronic Music mm -hmm. continued the fascination doing the live sound. Okay. That's when it, was, it. it started happening without me knowing it. Yeah. Until I finally got, you know, um, and then it was, I think Orson Welles Film School taking that eight track class sort of was like, what was yeah. I thinking? This is awesome. How do I do this stuff? Can I make yeah. a living yeah. at this? Yeah. Um, and so somebody helped get me a job. Oh, and I was going to say something else. Wayne Wadhams and Bill Gitt were the two people who eventually teamed with Joe Hostetter, the two track studio guy I talked yeah. about mm -hmm. and created, were the innovators in the creation of the Berkeley College, Berkeley, Berkeley University recording department mm -hmm. and studios. And when I found that out, my heart just gushed because those are the three people that's, that I love mm -hmm. and that really started me. Um, so I got this job at this little uh, recording studio in Boston, Massachusetts, Dorchester, Massachusetts. And the guy who owned it was like, you know, a real uh, Italian women don't belong in the studio. You know, uh, you, you're going to work with me. You're going to be my assistant. I told him I can't type. He said, I have a secretary. I need somebody. I'll teach you how to edit tape. We have all these children's albums, but you don't go in the studio. And I said something to the effect of, I, but I just want to go observe. I just want, want to watch. And he said, you could do that at night. I'm like, okay, okay. But meanwhile- <laughs> On I your was, own time. Yeah, on your own time. <laughs> um, and he said, you're gonna interface with students um, uh, and, and with, with people up and coming talent. He said, I'm mm -hmm. putting together a little cable TV TV show. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, cool. So anyway, I took the job, he paid me decently. And the guy who was the engineer was a guy named Bobby O'Connell. And um, Bobby was a sweetheart. He was one of the best people on the planet. He knew what my aspirations were, knew my background and taught me, you know, mm -hmm. taught me, let me observe. I watched setups and stuff like that. And um, even the tech guys, you know, the one, one tech guy was pretty nice to me. It was kind of off-putting at first, but he was eventually pretty nice because I really worked hard when I was cutting tape and doing all the children's albums and things like that. I learned to do all that stuff. I would interview talent for him for his little TV show. Mm -hmm. um, one, and one story I'll tell is that he had to go out and he had this comedian guy that was coming over. And he said to me, uh, okay, you're going to sit in this room and you're not going to, you're not going to laugh. You're not going to smile. You're just going to listen to what this dude has to say, what this guy has to say. And I said, okay. And so the guy came in and he's a sweetheart, young guy, probably in early twenties or something said he'd been gigging around town a little bit. And, and I said, well, Joe can't be here, but I'm sort of his surrogate. So you got to tell me your jokes and I'll just sit here and do, you know, I'm supposed to just listen and then tell Joe later. He goes, Oh, okay. I'm not, in, I'm not, telling I said, no no it's not going to happen so I said okay so I sat on a stool and he sat on a stool across from me and he started talking and telling stories and telling jokes and I was dying I finally I mean I burst out laughing I was like one of those yeah yeah, kind of yeah with tears rolling down my eyes and I was floored at how funny it was. I said, you're freaking hysterical. I love you. Oh my God, I'm going to tell Joe you're wonderful and blah, blah, blah. And da, 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 da. Well, anyway, long story short, that was Jay Leno. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I, I actually went to a comedy store a oh, hundred years ago. Um, and he was, he did a, you know, a quick cameo uh, mm -hmm. improv. 
and I was out his new yeah, and he, he was out, yeah. out in the bar. Uh -huh. And I went up to him and I tapped him and I said, Jay? And he said, yeah. I said, do you remember a time in Dorchester, Massachusetts, like a hundred years ago where you had to sit in front of a young girl and tell stories so that you could go on this horrible cable TV show that this Italian guy was doing? And he went, yeah, that was my <laughs> first TV show. I said, that was me. Oh, how <laughs> and he fun. hugged me and he said, oh my God, that was my first TV appearance. Oh, wow. How I mean, fun. Really, I mean that, was, that was the kind of things that would happen to me there. Um, they did a lot of orchestral uh, things. And I knew all the musicians from Berkeley. They're all local guys and stuff. Um, and at a certain point, Bobby, Bobby once told me, he said, you know, one day we're going to have a snow, a snow thing and I'm going to get snowed in and you're going to have to take over the session. This was like a year down the line mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, nah, that'll never happen. <laughs> but long story short, one time it did happen. He had he yeah. an orchestra out there and they were paying union scale. So they had to pay them. Mm -hmm. uh, Bobby called and couldn't make it in time. He said, you know how to do this, you know, get the sounds, get it going. And so he picked up the phone to talk to Joe and Joe kind of looked really grumpy and went, what? You know, she can't. And he said, she can just let her do it. Or you're going to be, end up paying these musicians for an hour until I can get here. The trains aren't even running yet. And so he said, okay. And he let me do it. And um, I started. And that was session. your first that was real in essence my first gig. And that's session. how it happens, isn't it? You, well, you know, it, it you was, don't say, I'm going to school for this. You know, you assist me for this long after two months and then then we'll move you into this chair or anything like that. It never happens like that. No. Does it? And no. it didn't, ha it didn't actually happen that way because what happened after that, when Bobby came and I gave him this, and he was very pleased with me and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And I, you know, and then Jill looked at me and said, okay, you downstairs. Um, and so I went back down, but the cool thing was the assistant engineer was leaving. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted the job. And so I applied, told Joe, I wanted it. And he had said no originally. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that day, Bobby went downstairs and said, can she have the job? And he said, okay, she can have the job, but she's going to earn less money. And if she screws up once, <sighs> that wasn't the language you used either. Yeah. Um, if he, if he, she screws up once, she's out on her ass. And I went, fine, I'll take the challenge. So I started being the assistant. Less money. At that point, less money. And he didn't end up paying me less money. He paid me the same amount. Okay, uh, and I had. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for so saying he, that. He didn't actually end up doing that. He threatened that. But um, I think mm -hmm. to a certain degree, he was a little proud that, you know, he had a hand in it or something of getting me to that point. One night we were adding some new equipment <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, we brought in these two guys, Don Richardson and John Miller to the studio to do the wiring. And I said, I would stay to learn, you know, how to do some mm -hmm. wiring and stuff. And so they did a lot of the wiring and they showed me some stuff and we were all sitting around. This was, you know, normal in the seventies just kind of sitting around in the studio at about one o'clock in the morning, getting stoned and talking about, you know, the work was done and talking about what was going on. And I was telling them all, you know, what I had accomplished, you know, up to now and what I wanted. And I wanted to work in a real studio and Joe won't let me do this. And Bobby did this for me and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he was the only good guy here. And they said, well, Hey, we're building a studio. Want to come join us? And I said, huh? He said, yeah, we're building a 16 track studio in Brighton, Massachusetts. And we'd love to have you. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, with your background, you know, all the musicians and all that stuff. So why don't you come join us? You know, we'll, there's not really a lot of money involved, but you know, and I said, I'll take other jobs. I'm still working at Paul's wall jazz workshop. You know, I'm, I can stay with yeah. this for a while. I'll, I'll continue with all my other stuff until I can make some money. And I said, okay. So I, that's when I joined Hub Studios. So see, is, you're so uh, it, it's, being it's, in the right place at the right time. And also, you know, um, you're attracting that uh, sort of these opportunities and because you had the skills and uh, your journey uh, it just evolved. Gets, yeah. Like it, this, it, and one thing led to another, led to exactly, another. Exactly. And, um, and, and that's how it, it, it happens, uh, showing up and participating. Yeah, and, and just doing everything make, that you can to continue, exactly. continue and persevere, persevere in the line, in the line of, I mean, as Lenise well knows, this was at a time where there just were no women doing this stuff, you know? Um, Not really. No, it was it, <laughs> not really. And so 
um, we built the studio. We actually mm -hmm. took a little side trip out to LA and, and, and San Francisco and toured all the big studios because we thought we were gonna build this monster, beautiful studio. Um, only to come back and find out that two of our investors had pulled out, but we still had money oh, for the shoot. building. So what we did was, which ended up being probably one of the best parts of my education, we built this studio. We built a shell within wow. a shell. Um, mm -hmm. We, John was one of these genius techie guys who built a console that was, I remember it was square mm -hmm. and it had 16 rotary faders. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it had a little slide pots for monitors front and back, which was, you know, headphones or, or whatever we had, we built, we, like I said, we built a shell within a shell and the crawl space between the ceiling mm -hmm. and the top of the shell was fiberglass packed. And oh I was the only person who could do the wiring up there. And why did we need wiring up there? Because John didn't like the clutter of cables on the floor. So we strung headphone cables from the ceiling down female, you know, quarter inches mm -hmm. all over the place so that you, so just you plugged in up plugged there up and oh we, God. and all of every, all the <laughs> headphones were coils so mm -hmm. that you could pretty much move around. There were long coil coiled mm -hmm. uh, cables. So I was the only one small enough to get in that space. We found out. So in 90 degrees, Boston, humidity and weather, I was up there mm. with mask on. Oh, and fiberglass going into your skin. And, oh, oh it God, was incredible. It's a, yes. I'm amazed you're alive. <laughs> I know. We did that. Um, he also didn't like cables on the floor. So all the mic cables were on dowels that, you know, strung that way. Um, and and uh, we got the entire thing built. Um, we had a 16 track machine. Mm -hmm. The 16 track machine, we, well, I'll tell you this one afterwards, but we wanted a, we, what we wanted was a counter on it because we mm -hmm. couldn't afford to buy an actual counter. So John created one with a bicycle chain oh. underneath <laughs> a rotary bicycle chain that sounded like a, a 747 was taken off when we went into rewind or fast forward. Oh it. my God. And it worked until That's it hilarious. did, until it didn't. Yeah. Um, but there were so many things. I mean, because everything was jury rigged. Uh, one night, Don and I were blasting music and getting very, very stoned. I was a stoner back then. Very, very stoned in the drum booth. And it was about three o'clock in the morning and we had just finished some final wiring. And we're laying on the floor. And both of us are flat on our backs on the floor. And all of a sudden, he looks at me and I look at him. And I went, did you feel that? And he said, yeah. And he goes, did you feel that? Did you really feel it? And I went, yeah. And he goes, and we looked at each other and we went, we've coupled. Meaning that the floor sank. Our, our, oh. our, 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 <laughs> God, I thought, I thought you, you were coupling in a different way. No, 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 no. <laughs> we meant the room had coupled with the floor. Okay. <laughs> our room within a room, our shell had dropped. Oh my God. Well, so you didn't have acoustical, um, we, it I don't remember filled with foam what, or anything. It was filled with whatever fiberglass, yeah, who knows something. fiberglass, which will go like that or sand, yeah. you know, it wasn't yeah. sand. It wasn't anything, you know, mm. what do we know, you know? But, Enough we did to this too. It. Yeah, not support. It supported it for a couple of months, but after like four months, it was yeah. toast. So we had to start, you know, our entire front entrance area had to be boarded up. And then we had to put fiberglass and more, yeah. you know, acoustic ceilings. So oh, we had to change everything so that we could stay, you know, suspended from whatever we could. What from an the experience. Outside world. But one of the good things about it is because everything was so jury rigged. Um, and I've told a lot of people about this. What we used for reverb was Hammond Springs that we had under the console. Mm -hmm. We would use little pieces of fiberglass that we would take off and put on to decrease or increase delay times, decay times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we had uh, a Neumann bi-directional mic down in the basement bouncing off our bouncing off our cement walls, depending mm -hmm. on, you know, we'd run down there and we'd put a good, we'd have an amp and, you know, put a guitar amp here, put a speaker mm -hmm. here, you know, put, put a mic yeah. here, have that wall there, have the glass, have a piece of glass there and bounce off, take the second bounce, bring that upstairs, mm -hmm. take the first bounce, bring that to the other side. And that would be our delay. 
uh, we had to, you had to learn to really just kind of like throw together whatever you could to make it work. And those, right. that was really thinking out of the box. Those were the kinds of things that, I mean, our equalizers we called, and I, I have pictures of all this stuff because of something that I did uh, two years ago. I was able to reach those guys and get pictures, whatever pictures mm -hmm. remained of this stuff. And we had these devices called peaker dippers and they were our EQ. And we would hard patch them into whichever plug needed to be under whatever rotary pot needed it to be. And then you, there was no, there was nothing on it that said high or low. You just kind of played with it. They were, yeah. they were parametric EQs, but without any numbers or anything on them. Yeah, you just, so, you well, just so what were you doing? You were listening. Ears. You were listening. It was all your ears. Yeah, you weren't you looking, no idea. you were it listening. Was, you were listening. See? We did have some DBX limiters um, that we were able to actually use that we could look. The monitor level for the studio, I'll never forget, was one fader that was attached mm -hmm. with, um, the, I don't, I, with gaffers Was it a tape. fader or a tone knob? A fader for the master oh, control. You had master. A fader. We had one fader, and that one fader wasn't this way. wasn't It was not wasn't vertical. It was horizontal on the side of the board. <laughs> I think it was gaffer tape on there. It oh was. I mean, it was an incredible kludge of a studio. But well, and what a great worked. way to learn. So segueing on to we did yes we did everybody i mean the cars original stuff was done there you know oh, um, because those guys were there billy and the beaters um we recorded there um we recorded uh it was jack mack and the heart attack it was whatever groups came out of boston aerosmith even um i did steve tyler there a couple of times um a lot of jazz um we did we did basically anywhere any anybody that came that was from boston at that mm -hmm. time that was making it mm -hmm. i had recorded at some point in that studio wow. and we did some amazing i mean i listened to some of the stuff i did then and i'm amazed it actually still works so let's cut now to you know that was that was foundation. Okay, that, that was, was foundation. Great. that was boston then i decided and i decided to move to california to los angeles Right. Okay. okay good. Okay. I moved Give us to a bit about that. Okay. Moved to Los Angeles um, in 1976 uh, and started sending out resumes and, uh, you know, pounding the pavement a little bit. I had no idea where I was going. I did not know anybody except the person that I was staying with. And um, uh, just That's started by, going. By the way, 1976 is when I started too. So you and I started at the very same time. Okay, so in 19 in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, yeah, 1976 when I moved here, and I was um, actually what I did was I would go, I would go to. I didn't send out resumes. I went with my resumes. That's mm -hmm. what we did. We went with our resumes. Yeah, and a lot of That's people you had to do that. Yeah, and people looked at you funny, like you want to do what? Yeah. Um, and I knew I had to be an assistant engineer, even though I was a full on engineer in Boston, I knew I had to be an assistant engineer. So I started going around requesting system engineer jobs. Um, one place in particular, which was Larrabee Studios. Mm -hmm. um, I met Jackie Mills, who was the owner mm -hmm. and manager, and we had a really great conversation and he sent me upstairs to talk to Bob Stone. Mm -hmm. Bob Stone was the head engineer. Mm -hmm. And he would, you, he usually sent people downstairs crying male or it didn't matter what they were, you know, that people had tears because he was impossible. He was such a, those were the days of the, you know, the head tech brutal, being the brutal, yeah, I mean, and, brutal, and, brutal. And, and especially to a chick, bad boy. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, Bob jerk. Stone went on to be Frank Zappa's engineer, did all the Donna Summer out, you know, at, he went on to be an amazing engineer there, but he was also the head tech. Mm -hmm. um, he was he was absolutely incredible. I came down smiling, and Jackie took that as a sign. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, he called me back for another interview, and then I had something pretty fortunate and in the stars. Somehow it happened. Client from mine called me from from Boston, called me, and said, "Hey, we just got signed to Capitol Records. We have they want us to do a three second saw, uh, demo." Uh, for Al Cooper. He's going to be producing us. Do you have a place you could do it? So I just went, oh, screw it. Let me see what happens. I, I said, how much money do you have? They said $3,000. I said, well, I don't know. 
let me try this one place that's given me a call back already. So I call up Jackie and I go, hi, Jackie, it's Sherry. I have a, uh, a group from Boston that needs a place to record a demo. They just got a deal with Capitol Records and they need a demo for Al, Al Cooper and um, they've asked me to record it. I don't suppose I could use perhaps Studio B to record it and engineer it with some help from somebody. And, and he went, absolutely. He said, I'll set it up. And Tavi well, Mote. Clients, clients yeah. always are a good thing to have yeah. in the back pocket. And Tavi Mote, who's passed away, but was the assistant engineer for the, for the house mm -hmm. at the time, said he would assist for me. And it was a Spectre, I believe it was a Spectrosonics board that they mm -hmm. had then um, before the API came. Yeah, Spectrosonics board or Quad 8, one or the other. And, um, and you know, it was a 24-track. And I did it. I set up everything. Um, I set up the monitor. I, I, I recorded everything. I got all the sounds. I did everything. Mm -hmm. Tavi helped. Him. You know, we worked together on yeah, it, on setting up and stuff. He assisted and, you. Right. Because also at Hub Studios, uh, the year before, we, or two years before I left, we did get a real console. We, had, we got mm -hmm. another partner. And so we got a quad eight console. So I was now familiar with real consoles. With so faders instead faders of tone knobs. And sends and things like that. <laughs> so and EQ. So when I got to this, when I got to Larrabee, I actually knew how to run a console. Mm -hmm. So um, we went through it. We did it. We did it all in like, I think a day, a day and a half, whatever. Um, recorded all the tracks, overdubs, mixed it. And after that, Tavi went to Je to to, to um, Jackie. Jackie and said, she knows what she's doing. She could be an engineer tomorrow. Hire her. Don't let her go. She really knows what she's doing. And so he called me up. He goes, Tavi said, you did great. And I said, oh, awesome. And he goes, you want to meet me at the studio in like two hours? I said, yeah. So he takes, it's so funny because, you know, he said, I'm, I'm you know, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he, we walk out to the parking lot and he has a set of keys, a hat and a t-shirt. And he goes, Here's your keys. Here's your T-shirt. Here's your hat. If a chick's going to make it in this business, she better fucking be from New York and have some balls. And you're that. <laughs> you're hired. And I went, oh, my God. That's exactly what he said to me. Word for word, wow. verbatim the same way. That's why I didn't change any words. And wow. I started laughing and I said, thank you. And I started at Larrabee Studios that following Monday. And I Fantastic. was there for years. Um, uh, you were there worked, for four years or for how many for, years? For, I was there for four years before I went to ABC Studios for a year. And then Larrabee bought me back because oh, I was okay. working with, I was the assistant for um, Nick Kosowski, Bruce Botnick. I was working mm -hmm. with um, uh, Rick Baconin at the time. Um, God, I can't remember all the engineers, Barry Rudolph, uh, Mark Fisitelli, Lenny. What are some Lenny, of the projects you worked on? Oh, um, give, yeah, us a um, few, give us a, a little clip of some of the artists. Um, uh, God, oh, God, there's so many. It's like I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Um, uh, um, when I was there, oh, the, God. The Spotnik, for example. Uh, bro, oh, OK. The big one was Eddie Money. Oh, um, OK. Eddie Money. And also the first experiment of putting the You Don't Bring Me Flowers together uh -huh. um, Bruce had a 24 track with um, Barbara Streisand and the other was with Neil Diamond. Mm -hmm. And that was, we put them together. Mm -hmm. We put them, we teamed them, we uh, synced the multi-tracks together. I remember that was the first time that that was actually done. They were both in different locations. Of course, they re-recorded it, I think, at a later date. But this was his version and her version they put together using the same orchestral piece. And I so did, did you have two this. tape oh, machines and, and a synchronizer? Yes, oh, two tape okay. machines and synchronizer. That's what was okay. so incredible. And also, um, I did the Cal Jam tapes, um, California Jam, which was the first big, you know, like after Woodstock kind of. Oh, big, right. You know, right. Yeah. right. Well, that was being done. Um, Bruce brought that in to the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, uh, God, I did, I did. I mean, I worked on so many things. We were doing a lot of pre-records for the Sunny and Cher show at the time. And so mm -hmm. we'd have a lot of artists that were coming through and I was working on those um, major I bet your orchestration skills came uh, in handy oh, during well, that Well, all the Donna Summer stuff, that was one thing. The uh, producer on that, and it's funny because Giorgio Morota wrote, you know, most of Donna Summer mm -hmm. stuff. And he's now the composer on my show. So I'm working with him like 40 years later, strangely oh, enough, oh, uh, on funny. my show, Queen of the South. But um, oh. the uh, producer on that, 
album mm -hmm. was very frustrated because all these orchestrations were happening and he would go, I just want, and we're using a Studer 24 track. And I just mm -hmm. want to punch in here and I want to punch in here and I need somebody who can, is there anybody in this place that can read a score? And Jackie goes, yeah, Sherry can go get her in here. And so he got me in there and he goes, you can actually read this. I said, yeah, absolutely. No problem. I said, I studied at Berkeley for a, for a couple of years, you know, in Boston. Mm -hmm. I, I got it. And he said, OK, I want this run of 16th notes and he'd circle it and just on the strings. And I'd go, OK. And, and, I, and then he'd say, I want this and I want this. And I'd go, OK. And he go, and can you do every other beat on this? I'm like, yeah, I could try if the, if the buttons <laughs> will push. <laughs> right. And so I started following the score at, in, out, in, out, mm -hmm. in, out, in, out. And I became his regular because I could do that stuff. Sure. And for a number of other composers also that got wind of the fact that there was somebody who could actually read an orchestration and punch in and out wherever they wanted. And that sort of elevated my status as not only an assistant engineer, but somebody who could take over sessions too. And so with the Bruce Botnick thing, when I did, um, when I did Andy Johns, worked with Andy Johns on the Cal Jam tape, and that's another story with Andy Johns that I've told about, told mm -hmm. a lot of people. But um, it came in handy because Andy would sleep for a while and, and then I'd do overdubs in another room and we'd go back and forth and stuff for the week. I got we a question there. about that. When, if, when, you got, when you were doing more than just assisting, did you get paid more too? Yeah. Uh, yeah, did I they think supplement I did. your income for your, your knowledge think, and skill? Yeah, I think. Well, yes and no. Um, I think they gave me extra. I think they did give me extra. They were very generous. They never, and they were very, okay, Jackie's wife was the bookkeeper and also part owner. And she was very excited about having, we ended up having like, I think two other women after me because- Didn't Sylvia I, Massey go there too? Uh, maybe she way after- at Larrabee? Maybe, but I was only there until like 83 and that was it. That's when the mm. bottom dropped out. Mm. But- um, but uh, no, they, they, you know, like with, uh, I did a Michelle Phillips album with Jack Nitsche as the, um, as the producer and Kim, the uh, engineer had to go up North to start another album because he was from mm -hmm. San Francisco. So he said, well, Sherry can do all the overdubs and then I'll come down and we'll mix it. Mm -hmm. And so Jack went, okay. Cause he had faith in me and he believed I could do it. And so that was my first credit. Jack, he grabs me one day and he goes, I have to show you something. And I said, what? And he goes, look. And what he did was he brought the one sheet from the album credit mm -hmm. and it said, girl engineer, boy engineer, which I thought <laughs> was so cute because he didn't just, you know, he just, he put us both like as engineers, mm -hmm. like girl engineer and boy engineer, because it was such a novelty. He thought it was funny and I thought it was hysterical and I yeah. loved it because it was actually my first engineering credit. Mm -hmm. that I'd ever Oh, gotten. fantastic. So that was on Michelle Phil Phillips' album, Jet with Jack Nitsche. Um, And then, uh, of course, you know, we go into, I mean, uh, the Andy John story was, you know, which I've told a lot is uh, uh, Jackie knew that he was very British and mm -hmm. did not want to, would not be happy to be locked in a studio for a period of a week, which we were day and night doing the 30 or 40 odd Cal Jam tapes while the overdubs yes. were going on. And yeah, we were going, we were going Andy Johns is notorious for right. being a, um, a prick. And so we knew, <laughs> difficult. And we knew that. Difficult, yes. Right. Flamboyant. And flamboyant. Yeah. And yeah. so Jackie called me up and he said, look, Bruce totally want, he, he said that he wanted you to mm. be in this and Andy's gonna have problems. So I said, problems why? And he said, because you're a girl. And I said, okay, what did you do? And he said, well, what they did sometimes was they used the nickname Shay instead of Sherry. They go mm -hmm. on the phone, they go, yeah, Shay will be there. Sherry, Shay, it doesn't matter how fast you say it, sometimes you can't tell. So yeah. he said, we, we use Shay and go over every four letter word and bad phrase you can think of in your head, write them down even if you have to, because you may have to spout them out tomorrow. And I went, huh? He goes, trust me. I said, okay. So we get into the office the first day that we're starting. Andy walks in. He's sitting down talking to Jackie. They're having a nice conversation. I walk in and I sit down and he goes, Andy, this is your assistant. This is Shay, Sherry. And he gets up and he storms up you know, out of his seat. And he goes, you gave me a bird, a bird, a freaking bird. And Jackie looks at me and goes, Sherry. And, and I went, every four letter word, every phrase that I could think of that was yes. disgusting. I wrapped it out for like a minute straight. 
And when I finished, I sat down very calmly because I stood up to just expound. And mm -hmm. I remember I sat down very calmly and I smiled and looked at Jackie and Jackie went, Andy, you okay? You good? And he goes, awesome. Let's go. Or not awesome, but he yeah, said, whatever yeah. it was at the time. He said, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, something like that. And he's mm -hmm. like, let's go. So, you know, we knew what to do and we did it. And what, yeah, on, what we was the point of than anything? Yeah, what was the point of that? Explain what that was. He was afraid that he wouldn't be able to be himself. Yes. He wouldn't be able to, you know, loosen up and say fuck shit or whatever, you know, curse yeah. words. He wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, say being a proper breath, things. They, yeah, they felt yeah. that they're uh, right. They needed yeah, he needed uh, to be proper, banter. right, right. Yeah. Their banter. I mean, he let me come down when they were recording. He was recording the Rolling Stones doing overdubs at United Western after we finished the album. And he said, "Come down." He said, "Come watch," which was fantastic. I yeah, got a chance to do huge. that and that's observe huge. him. And and he was just a sweetheart from that mm -hmm. point on. It was like we shared champagne toasts every night, you know, because they treated us like gold. I mean, they catered it to the max, and it was a wonderful time. That was sort of the last years of the. The heyday, the heyday, yeah, and the big of, budgets, and, and the uh, big big bucks being spent on meals and things like yeah, that. Yeah. And it was, a, I mean, it was a great time to be in the industry and to have moved out here and to have gotten it together. Certainly but I knew was. that I was still, I mean, just like you, if you remember Music Connection at that time, oh, they yeah. do some articles. I mean, I found articles that I have of myself, you know, you know, chick engineer this, that, and the other thing. And it's, you know, we were still there were just a couple of us. I mean. Really, wow. I mean, there was just a few of us, so we had a rough time. Uh, in 1983, I, I kind of left Larrabee as an assistant in 1980, I think it was, or 81. Mm -hmm. I started going freelance, and that was because a guy named Kim Fowley, a producer named Kim Fowley, uh, another worked, notorious, uh, flamboyant, um, very, very much character so, who I to this day still adore. Um, but I worked with him on the or on the um, Runaways album, and I was mm -hmm. the assistant engineer. So what? Tell the elements about that all girl band. All girl band. Um, I, I think it was on MCA Records I'm or Capital. Exactly no, sure. I think they were on but Capital. The point Records. is, the all girl band engineered by uh, a woman. No, no, no. I said assistant engineer. Oh, assistant engineer. I assisted, oh. assistant engineer. I was not okay. the engineer on the runways. I oh, was okay. the assistant engineer. Um, Tavi Mote was the engineer. Oh, okay. But Kim saw a lot in me because I took over for Tavi occasionally and I would do some overdubs here and there. And I also handled the girls really well, whereas mm -hmm. he wasn't handling them well, neither was Tavi, but I had a rapport with them. And he saw that, he sensed yeah. it. And so after we did that album, he got a deal for a group called The Orchids with MCA Records. And he looked at me another all came girl in, band. another all girl band. And he mm -hmm. said, I want you to engineer it. Are you ready? And I said, absolutely. Yes. And so I was like, of course. And, you know, am I ready? I've been ready for yeah, I've been ready and, for a long time. And at the same time, I had also I was also working in a number of other different studios freelance mm -hmm. and got to work with um, a composer, Pete Robinson, who did Ernie Watts's first album. And I did that mm -hmm. with him. Um, I engineered Ernie's first album and um, was slated to do the second one, Electra Dropped Us. But um, I did a number of other albums also outside of that. But Kim was Kim was kind of like the first major record deal that I that I got. And so I did the Orchids album with him and mm -hmm. and I did I even did arranging. I, I, this is another thing I did vocal arrangements on the Orchids album. And, oh, great. and then oh. I worked with Kim on five or six other albums and did vocal arrangements and some arrangements for some of the other mm -hmm. artists that he was he was producing. So Kim became my mainstay of work for a number of years simultaneously. I was doing albums and work at other studios with other artists. I did a couple of reggae albums and a couple of things like that. Yeah. Now at this time though, isn't this when you were starting to segue into um, uh, post-production? No, 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 not yet. No, not yet. Uh, I, in, 19, in 1983 mm -hmm. is when the bottom dropped out of the music industry and that's when yep. I I needed to I needed to figure out what I was going to do because there were very few albums uh, happening. And mm -hmm. uh, somebody that I worked with on an album 
years before had called me up and said that he was working at a small television station called KTTV in uh, um, Los Angeles and was going away for summer vacation and needed somebody to take over. He said, you know the equipment, uh, you just need to learn about time code. And I said, time code, isn't that that horrible sound that pops up whenever you uh, um, lift up the track for 24? And he said, yeah, exactly. He said, but it does a lot more. Come over and I'll teach you. So he taught me, you know, within a few minutes and mm -hmm. uh, then he went off for summer vacation and I took over his job. The first show that I did was 30, uh, uh, was Three's Company. Three's Company. Uh, Three's Company, which very was a Very popular sitcom, TV show. Very popular. Then. That was my first big show that I did. And from there, I went on to another uh, number of other small studios, but EFX Systems was the first real post-production facility that mm -hmm. I worked for. And they were transitioning from a music studio into a post-production facility. And I started doing audio sweetening there where I would mix everything. And it wasn't until years later that we evolved into, I mean, I would dialogue edit, I would, you know, I would do it all. But mm -hmm. it wasn't until years later that we evolved into separation, you know, of, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, specific I would, I would be a dialogue mixer, somebody else would make music, somebody else would mix sound effects. And that's how it mm -hmm. was at one time. It was a three-person team, not, right. two, not a two-person as it is now. It was one or two. And so right. that was pretty much when I started working at EFX that I really became a dialogue mixer. And I became a dialogue mixer more so because um, I was, as, as a lead audio sweetening mixer, where I mixed dialogue effects and music, I mixed it all on a number of shows, mm -hmm. dialogue was king. And so that's- Still where is. I, that's where, yeah, but that's where I, I sort of evolved into mm -hmm. things. So that's kind of how I moved into post-production, uh, you know, uh, various studios in between, Larson mm -hmm. Studios and then Sony Studios mm -hmm. and then Smart Post Sound. So I've kind of, you know, I've pretty much stayed I mean, I was at EFX Systems for 10 years. I was at Sony Studios for almost 10 years. I was, at, and then I went over to Larson Studios for a year and then went back to Sony again and then went back to Larson and was there mm -hmm. for almost 10 years. And now I'm at SmartPost for almost 10 years, which gives you an idea of how many years I seem to stay places. I just don't move a lot. So you're exclusively now post-production. I'm exclusively uh, post-production. That's yeah, pretty much um, the only thing that I do is re-recording mixer. And I worked on, I just, I work on wonderful shows. I'm very mm -hmm. lucky. And when I can, I mean, I, I've done a lot of features, uh, small features um, when I have time, but yeah. TV is sort of where I have decided to live uh, episodic TV, dramatic TV. And I really enjoy it and I really love it. So I've kind of decided to stay in that. Well, these are all union. You're in the union as well yes. too. This is, you're not an uh, independent contractor. No. Yeah, no, so. anything that I do goes, you know, is, is right. unionized. So that, that has a, a quite an impact on your choices as well. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. And the houses and, that I, that I'll work with. Mm -hmm. um, how would you, uh, being in the union, um, just a little aside here, how did you get into the union uh, that, uh, uh, when These I girls went to might want to hear about. <laughs> okay, well, when I was working at EFX Systems, uh, one year we we got a show called Thirty Something. Yes. And Thirty Something had to be a union show, so my company had to get in the union, which brought us all in the union. Quite honestly, at the oh. time, I saw no reason for it, and I kind of fought against it because mm -hmm. I didn't think there was any benefit to it, from what I knew. Now, boy, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. I mean, the benefits, uh, you know, it may not do anything for my career, quote unquote, being in the union, except allowing me to work in the houses that I want to be working in, but the medical insurance and benefits and such. Yeah. And the pension and all those things. Pension. <laughs> yeah. All those things are so worth it. If you can get into the union, get into the union at an early age. Thank you for, a, for sharing that. Crewing. I know we're, this is a, uh, living history, but also part of your history is that you have a successful long career that uh, is supporting you well now and will yes. support you in your retirement. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. Um, no. That's that's an important goal for yeah. everybody out there. <laughs> yeah, no, they should. People should get into the union and try to uh, maximize their benefits at an early age. Yeah. So, wow. Well, um, do you have, uh, 
any other words of wisdom based on your history and your trajectory uh, that you can say to encourage up and coming women engineers? Was it was it an issue being a woman very much for you, or did your skills um, precede you? And I think uh, talk, okay, talk about that a bit, please. I think that yes, it it was an issue when I was a recording engineer, um, but it was an issue that was overcome by my skills. Um, and as a re-recording mixer, it was definitely an issue when many people walked into the room, the first thing they would say is, I never saw a lady engineer before, but right. my skills overcame it. The interesting thing was um, that my boss once told me at Sony, he goes, the, I have to tell you, they always remember your name. Whereas they never remember the guy's names. Like if it's been two years, they go, and they'll say the guy that I worked with, what stage was it? It was on the stage on the left. I kind of liked him, but they never, they always say your name. They always say, oh, I want to work with Sherry. I'd like to, they always remember your name instead of one of the guys. And he said, and that's a credit to you. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Being in their head and they liked working with you. Um, enough to remember, whereas they liked working with the guys too, but they didn't stand out. It wasn't a standout. It was expected almost. So okay. I always felt you had to work, you had to be better than. Well, also throughout your career, uh, what kind of attitude did you feel was uh, effective? Me. I was just me. I wasn't yeah. a bitch. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a chip on my shoulder. Um, mm -hmm. I always felt that um, I wasn't going to fault people for being ignorant. It's mm -hmm. the way they were brought up. Yes. And we all come from different times. And in the yes. time that we grew up and that our socialization took place, we know what is expected and mm -hmm. we know what other people expect to see or what their expectations are in general. And so you can change those expectations exactly. by being the best version of you that you can put out there. As an engineer, yes, and and it is a, a very effective um, uh, approach because it is uh, being aware of that mindset, and it's about re-educating. Yes, um, because they have no other point of reference. No, no, especially they have... especially back then. Yeah, especially back then. I mean, my only point of, you know, the when I grew up, I was supposed to get married and have kids. <laughs> you yeah. know, that didn't work. <laughs> Um, no, that never and, you know, and my parents realized early on that they had somebody that was definitely born in the wrong era because I was just a rebel from the get go. Yeah. Um, and when the 60s rolled around and hippie world entered into it, it was like, yeah, I'm going there. That yeah. makes sense. They're rebelling yeah. against everything. That was just my nature. That's who I was. But right. that wasn't who most of my friends turned into. Um, most of them grew up as they were supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, that's why it's an exclusive little lot and totally worth it. Yes, it has uh, its uh, challenges being a, a woman in this industry, but clearly from the beginning, you were a musician, you were a recording engineer, you're a post-production re-recording pro <laughs> now first. Yeah. You just happen to be a woman. Yeah, but those but uh, your motivation and all of that was kind of genderless. Yeah, uh, totally. It was yeah. this is what I'm meant to do. And I know yeah. that this is what I'm meant to do. And so I'm yeah. just going to do it regardless of who tells me I can't. And many yeah. people told me I couldn't. And there were there were many instances, especially getting into re-recording, um, you know, when and in fact, I remember when I was hired at Sony, I was taking over somebody, a major mixer's position who was, who was uh, retiring. And I remember looking at the person who was hiring me, who I have enormous respect for at this point. And I said, well, what are the guys going to think? You know, I mean, are they going to be able to take direction from me, you know, a, a okay. woman? And he said, you know something? You have the qualifications. You've done the, you've done the work. If they can't deal with it, I'll fire them. That's all. I'll fire them. I've interviewed 10 people and you're the only one that I believe could sit in that chair. So deal with it. And 
And one of them did get fired actually a year after we started. I had never said anything, but the clients said that he was being, he was being, you know, disrespectful to me on stage and I didn't want to make waves mm -hmm. and being the first woman lead mixer uh, at a lot in yeah. town. I just was like, I just want to hold my ground. I, I've got a hard head. I, nobody's going to bang into me. And I just let it go. But the clients went to the boss and said, a, this guy is being a real asshole to her. And he fired him the week before Christmas. Well, in fact, he fired him and said, no, we won't stand for that. You're the one who the clients are coming to see. You're the one that, I mean, you're the one that's bringing in the dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you're the one we care about. And this yeah. guy is just being an ass because he doesn't know how to be a team player. And he's mm -hmm. being a chauvinist pig. He's out. Yeah. Yeah. And they, this happened before I even knew. I just walked yeah. in and then he came to me and said, he's fired. He's out. I'm like, what do I do? I need a music maker. Yeah. Did you find that uh, you had more uh, challenges on that level in post-production than you did in the music business? Well, definitely in post-production only because it wasn't, it, at least there were like four or five of us in music. Mm -hmm. You know, at least we had that. In mm -hmm. post-production, re-recording, mixing, as far as I know, there weren't any others. I learned of some in later, you know, year or two at later or something like that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. as far as lead mixers on dubbing stages, I really didn't know any. Mm -hmm. And they didn't either, apparently, mm -hmm. because I was an anomaly to them when yeah. I first came to, to all of them, to Sony, to to Universal, uh, Tadeo at the time. Um, I mean, I had a lot of offers when I left DFX and, and went looking on the lots. Mm -hmm. I did have offers, but Sony just seemed like the best fit because of the timing. Mm -hmm. But actually, I had offers at a number of different lots and stages because they liked what I had already done. And the show 30 something was, of course, a big entree for me right. because it was an episodic dramatic talkie show and for a dialogue mixer it was in many ways you know it really made my career really it launched my career that way aside right. from all the other things that i did also well it's uh this your your history your story your journey um it's always it's long <laughs> so wonderful and intriguing and i know you and i have often gone on uh for, hours uh telling our stories and your stories are just so compelling to me and inspiring to me and we have our parallel paths yeah. um i'm de i'm delighted that uh i got to be a part of some of your journey and and i'm so glad you're part of mine yeah. and um before we sign off here i have uh, just one more question for you um what do you know that no one else does? What do I know that nobody else does? Ah, I don't know if nobody else knows this, but I would say what, a, I don't, wait, what do I know that nobody else does? I think I know how to, oh, other people have learned it in time. I think that it comes with age, learning that there's a balance. You know, I mean, I, you know, what have I learned that I never would have thought to have learned at an earlier age or an earlier time in my life? That would, that to me makes more sense. It's like, I've learned how to balance my life and work because I've been at that point where seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year was my norm. And I also yeah. know that to get where I wanted to get, to live the kind of life that I want to live now, um, I may, may have had to do that. But the truth is what I've learned and what I know now that I never thought I could say was I feel like I've achieved a balance. Well, very good. Yes. Yeah, so I think that does come with age too. And that's, uh, it, it becomes more important. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, just possibly, is there just one special something that doesn't even have to be uh, about engineering or post-production or musicianship 
Um, it can be just anything in your life. Is there one thing that you think that you might know that nobody else, else knows? Doesn't? That no one else knows. They didn't ask me this, thank God. I haven't a clue what it would be. <laughs> I haven't a clue what it would be. I really honestly don't know. Okay, I know what's on a piece of paper on my wall and nobody else does. There you go. There, that's one. Okay. That's a start. That's that's one thing. Yeah. Um, I know what the boxes on my wall are for and nobody else does. That's, that's right. And, okay. Um, yeah. Um, because <laughs> I have these little boxes on my wall and nobody knows what they're for, but I know what they're for. Yeah. Okay. And when people ask me, I just go because they are. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, well, this has been so much fun as I knew it would be. And I just, we could go on and on and on. And we will um, for drinks afterwards. <laughs> yes, we actually are. <laughs> <laughs> more stories to be told right, right, right. Um, okay. well i want to thank um sound girls and carrie kais and uh caroline and definitely want to thank my dear precious friend um sherry klein for sharing her experiences and stories and i know she is inspired and um reinforced and empowered a lot of you girls out there and guys as well. Um, so thank you so much. You're very welcome, ladies. And thank you, Sound Girls, for letting me be part of this. And Lenise, I have to tell you something very funny in the midst of all this. I love <laughs> the fact that you sometimes correct me when I'm telling a story because I have forgotten <laughs> what I've told you because it's been, she reminds me so many times of things <laughs> that I did in my life that I have totally forgotten about or thrown by the wayside because I just that don't think they're important or anything. Like it's so many things, so many <laughs> stories. So I, I applaud you for having a memory of my life that I have forgotten and make and helping me remember the many areas of my life that I just kind of threw by the wayside and don't even think about. <laughs> So well, my just I appreciate pleasure. that friendship. I, it, yes, yes. Well, I I love having those memories and <laughs> being able to <laughs> remind you of all those special events and uh, some of them we certainly can't even talk about here. Yes, yeah, but uh, uh, and that's okay. We yeah. all have those still there. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, the important thing I think is what you've been able to share with everybody here is just tenacity, um, skill, um, practice, um, perseverance, uh, uh, having a great personality and being able to hang and turn on a dime and be creative, uh, using both sides of your brain very well. <laughs> and um, just showing how all of these things that have uh, started back with the piano lessons going all the way up to where you are now and I bet you someday again you're going to pick up that guitar and I uh, still have it I still have the epiphone well, epiphone good good I Make won't sure. give that one up I'll I know that's going to happen I just know so anyway um how all of these things are part of your journey your unique journey that makes you Sherry Klein Thank you, Lenise. This thank has you been so much. a total pleasure. And thank you. Okay. <laughs> bye for now. Okay. Bye.